first, I got to start off by telling you a story. Every morning I go for a walk. An elder told me that the best time to pray is while you're walking on Mother Earth. That's the best time to connect. As you know, March has been a, a fairly cold spring uh, so far. And I went walking out one morning, I think it was like quarter to seven. Just, I just see the daylight coming in from the eastern sky. It was minus 20 and there was a very cold wind blowing as well, so I estimated the wind chill would probably be minus 30. Uh, and I dress appropriately for, for all different types of weather. Anyways, I was walking and uh, finished praying and then this thought, this thought came running through my mind. It asked me a question. What creates worldview? According to the uh, Oxford Canadian Dictionary, the definition of worldview is a comprehensive view of the philosophy of your life, of the world and the universe. So what creates that? So when Mama and Mama Dadi, Dean, I was thinking about it and thinking about it and my style is that uh, I sleep on questions until I can get a, a good vision, a good clear, clear understanding of the question. Then I started thinking about it and what the feeling was, that was coming through is that um, probably language is the first principle. Uh, and I'll talk a little more about language, but I want to give you the principles first and then I can go back and, and talk about it. The second principle, what creates your worldview, is your experiences. Uh, experiential learning from cradle to grave. The third principle is the way your mother raised you, the way my mother raised me, the cultural teachings, the socialization, etc. And what comes out of that is uh, your identity, who you are, uh, what's your purpose here, why did you come here uh, to Mother Earth to briefly walk on her to this soul plane? And thought about that and I started asking uh, different colleagues and different scholars uh, what creates worldview? What creates your worldview? And the majority of them answered language. Others said culture before experience. And many said identity. Worldview and identity is the same. Because I speak three languages, uh, the language of the Metis, I speak English as well. I'll start off with the Cree language, the little that I know about it and I'm still a student. My understanding of any indigenous language, or probably most indigenous, language, indigenous languages, if not all, the majority of the words are verbs, like 80% of the words are verbs, and 20% are nouns. and when I speak it, because there's so many verbs, I see a living, moving universe, and everything's related. Everything's connected. Uh, there's about 20% nouns, but most of them are verbs. You know what verbs are? They're action words, they're movement. Um, and that's exactly what Mother Earth is. 
because we're riding on this sphere. It rotates, Mother Earth rotates at a thousand miles an hour. And every morning, we go and meet the sun. Because as you know, the sun doesn't move. It's Mother Earth that moves. And as we're meeting the sun, then it creates the illusion that the sun is rising. We have this term, the sun's riding, right? Well, actually, it's not rising. We're going to meet it like this. Picture yourself riding this big ball, this, this world. And as we're going to meet it, it appears it's, it's rising. In the same way, we have this expression, uh, the sun is setting, but really it's not. In Nagatah, we're leaving the sun because we're riding over the crest, right? And it looks like it's setting. The other thing about Mother Earth is that it orbits the sun counterclockwise. It doesn't orbit clockwise, but it orbits counterclockwise like this. And its speed or velocity is about 67,000 miles an hour. That's what we're moving right now. That's what we're riding Mother Earth. And her daily, and she makes a journey around the sun every year, about 365 days or more a year. She's got an axis that move, Mother Earth moves like this. Um, and we've just come through equinox, and where the axis was right up and down, perpendicular to the sun, if you can imagine it. So our ancestors prayed because if it stayed up like this, we had to pray to make it lean towards the sun. And its maximum inclination, inclination to, the, to the sun is 23 degrees. It moves 23 degrees this way. So June 21st, we're at our maximum inclination towards the sun. And that's what gives us the longest daylight hour because the sun is, sunlight is hitting Mother Earth like this. And then we have to pray to bring it back again, to start journeying the other way. Again, September equinox, we gotta pray to keep it going. And December 21st or the 20th or about there, it stops, momentarily stops. Again, we have to pray to bring it back. The ancients, our ancestors knew that. So when you speak um, fluent, when you understand Sagao uh, and uh, you're taught this. It's, it's a natural process. It's, it's natural, we call it natural laws. And the other thing, you know, like when I say I want to translate it into English as bushland Cree. But, but just remember that Cree is not an indigenous word. It comes from another word, Christos. So what happened was the story is that when the Jesuits first came to the East Coast, they saw these people, six feet tall, unbelievably built, you know, like the Huron and the Mohawk people on the East Coast, and the Mi'kmaq and others. But their ancestors were tall because at that time, the oxygen content in air was probably 26 percent. 
Now we're down to 23%. So the Jesuits, ah, Christos, in the image of Christ, their God, Jesus. Uh, and later it got short, shortened to Kri, K-R-I-E. Then eventually, through colonization of our language, it became C-R-E-E, Kri. -E, it's not an indigenous word. It's a colonizing word. So that's why you heard some of the other presenters say that we shouldn't translate our words into English because um sisikapik squian atest can stuhti na wow atest moya. But when I'm talking like this, some of you will understand it, some of you won't. But the sounds I'm making, the words I'm saying, are nothing but sounds. The meaning sits in the sound. So when you hear a sound, and if you can interpret it back into a meaning, into a word, you'll understand, just like the way I'm speaking. I'm speaking English, but really I'm, I'm speaking in sounds. The meaning sits in the sound, so therefore, when you hear me making these English sounds, you can get the meaning. But keep in mind that English is a colonizing language. And it's got very few verbs and nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, etc. They have many rules, like when you, go to uni when you go to school, you start taking English in school. They have all these rules of English. In our language, in indigenous language, there are not many rules. It's natural. It's inherent in us. It's in our blood memory, because that's the language of our ancestors from time immemorial. You know, when we say a word like universe, what does that mean? My interpretation is uni is one and verse is song. So we live in one song. Every sound we make adds to that one song, adds to that one song, universe. And because our language comes from Mother Earth, and you've heard other presenters say that, um, and I can give you examples of, of how Mother Earth um, names herself and all her gifts. For example, Oma Saskatchewan Sibi, this river that passes through Edmonton, it's called Saskatch Saskatchewan. Well, the interpretation of that in English is fast flowing water. So if you go and sit by the river, Saskatchewan River, you'll hear the sound, Saskatchewan, Saskatchewan. Um, in the same way, um, where I live, there's ravens and magpies and blue jays, uh, et cetera, et cetera, you know, there's coyotes and and uh, when I hear Kahkago, that's our Cree word for raven. And I hear them saying, Kahkago, Kahkago, Kahkago. Like ravens make about, they say, at least 40 different sounds. So when you hear that sound, you don't even have to see what's making it. You see a picture in your mind it's like a holograph. So when indigenous people speak their words, they see pictures. Their indigenous words creates a hologram, a hologram or a picture in your mind. It keeps you uh, connected. Because we live with the land. We don't live off the land. Aski uh, and when Omaski Kamishiak, 
it's it's total it's the everything within mother earth when we say what a ski it's a very holistic word now when i speak english um, i seem disconnected it seems like everything's separated um, and i don't see pictures uh, I don't know what I see, maybe words, but a question that I've had for many years is um, why, why did the colonizers think they were so separated from the land? Why did they think they were so disconnected from Mother Earth? Uh, for the longest time I thought that was because of their signs, Western signs. And then recently, uh, I was gifted a book for my 76th birthday called Hospicing Modernity. And the author is Vanessa. Her mother is a uh, Brazilian Indian, a Guarani, and her father is German. Her grandmother's German had come from Germany and settled in, in Brazil. She also apparently had questioned, why do these colonizers seem so separated and disconnected? So according to her research, um, the early Greek philosophers, uh, Socrates, uh, Aristotle, Parades, etc. They started philosophizing that the trees and the countryside no longer teach me anything. So they brought the teachings into a building that we call now a classroom like this. So it was men that became the teachers. Women were not initially the teachers, even though when they raise us, as I mentioned before, you know, we spend, uh, she carries us in her womb for nine months. We hear her heartbeat from the time we're born. When we take our first breath, uh, she starts talking to us and singing to us, etc. But all we heard was just sounds. Then eventually, started attaching a meaning to the sounds she was making. So by the time children are two, three years old, they're speaking. But from the time they're born, from the time we were born, everybody in this room, we started making sounds. We were laughing and crying to express ourselves, etc. And as we aged, we started speaking a few words like mama, probably the first word, or nemama. Fathers don't really uh, look after the children from the time they're born. It's the mothers. We sat in her lap, in our mother's lap, for at least the four, first four years. And she breakfast us, you know, you know, breastfeeding. It changed our diapers, fed us, put us washed us, put us to bed, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, fathers didn't do too much of that because their task, their service was to go out there and earn a living, bring the money home to buy things. As the, the Greeks started teaching in buildings, in classrooms, they became more and more separated from Mother Earth. They separated to the point where they turned around and they started colonizing Mother Earth. They started colonizing the land. They started farming, cutting off all the, cutting down all the trees. Has anybody been to Europe by any chance? How many of you have been to Europe? I've been to 14 countries in Europe. Uh, at a young age, in my early 20s, I was interested in who these people are. 
it seems to me that Musa Gihtu and Kiyapasihtato, Gustatsu and Kiyapasihtato, they weren't using love when they come here, they're using fear. You know, the, the teachings say, we have two emotions where everything comes from. One is real and one is unreal. And those two emotions are love and fear. Which one is real and which one is unreal? And if you can figure that out, you'll come to a place of peace. You'll be a doki and you're making oneness. So if you're using love, uh, that's the first gift Creator gave us. Love. I don't know how else to translate that because you lose so much of the meaning when you translate from an indigenous word into an English word into the colonizer's language because the sounds are different. You know, that's why it's so difficult to use Roman orthography and uh, the English alphabet to write out our, our words, the sounds of our indigenous words. The meaning's lost. You lose, you only end up with probably a quarter or a third of the meaning when you translate. And the other thing about the English language, you know, they they write everything. Everything's written. And to me, writing technology is archaic. It's old. Because writing cannot capture what I'm talking about, because my hands are moving, I have facial expressions, I'm using a male voice, my eyes are looking at people, etc. So when you write, you can't capture that. Writing, to me, the more I understand language and communication, the more I realize that language is not the way to communicate, like to, to uh, learn to speak an indigenous language. Uh, and that's mentioned up here by Dr. Uh, Daniels as well. And other people are starting to realize that now. And then if we continue this on, because this is colonization. Writing is an example of colonization. Uh, and there's a debate whether or not uh, indigenous people used syllabics um, to write the sounds. But then when you start doing the research of it, uh, you, you know, there's one man, Mandelbaum, that developed uh, Slavics. Others will say that uh, it was given to an elder in a dream, Slavic. So, so I don't know which is uh, which is accurate yet. Maybe it, maybe some somebody here's done some research on the creation of Slavics, but it's not used much anymore. The tendency is to use Roman orthography. And if you use, when you speak the English, the English words, it creates another worldview. Um, because if that's your language, we know language is alive because language is sounds, made up of sounds. And from an indigenous uh, worldview, Every sound has four aspects, spiritual, emotional, mental, and physical. Because the way a sound travels, it travels as a, as a particle in a wave at the same time. That's the same way the light travels. As a particle in a wave, it'll, it'll shift. And in the particle is the message the meaning of the word. And right now, Pisimawa um, is getting stronger. We can feel the heat. So it's sending messages to Mother Earth, to one ska. 
because Mother Earth's been hibernating. And uh, I live with the land. I live on the Buffalo Lake Métis settlement. I live isolated from others, because everybody in Buffalo Lake lives out on the land. We don't have a hamlet or a town site. What I see now is that the ravens, like a female raven, will start carrying a twig in its beak, just a little twig, trying to get the attention of the male. Because ravens are one of the first to start making a nest. What's the win? And owls are doing the same. You know, the, the bigger birds that don't migrate, they need a head start. So that's the sun doing that. Every month in our indigenous languages has a name. Like, I'll start with February. February was Kahiopiusim, the eagle moon. That's when the eagles come back to this part of the world. March is Niskopisim. That's when the geese come back. Canada geese come back, and you've probably heard them, maybe seen some of them already. You go April, Oma, Aigpisim, Yugana. That's when the frogs come out. You'll start hearing frogs, and so on and so on. That's um, the way our ancestors lived by, is by the movement of the moon, the movement of the sun, the movement of Mother Earth. And that's how they stayed connected. You got these two options for a world worldview. You got an indigenous created worldview and a Western created worldview. And yesterday I was very, very happy because of the, the Vatican had revoked uh, the law of discovery or terra nullis, vacant land. The story about that is that uh, as the European countries uh, developed, Europe, I don't know if anybody studied the history of Europe or not, but I'll just hit upon a few uh, time periods. The first empire, one of the first empires, was the Roman Empire. In about uh, 300 AD, the rivers had frozen over, and tribes come from Germany and elsewhere to ransack Rome. And that's how the Roman Empire fell. And it didn't fall right away. It, it took about maybe 400 years to fully disintegrate. But then what happened was it got plunged into the Dark Ages. Has anybody heard about the Dark Ages of Europe? Well, uh, the Dark Ages were from about 700 AD to 1300 AD. About 600 years, wars were fought, uh, countries developed their boundaries, every country had an army. They estimate the European wars killed about a hundred million people over that time period. So they were very, very sophisticated in the method of killing people, of killing one another. So they had separated by then they colonized and they started running out of uh, natural resources in Europe. They uh, destroyed all the forests, most of the animals. They started mining, etc. And um, so in the 1400s, uh, by then, the Roman Catholic Church had developed. It's very interesting how it came about too because the last em emperor of Rome, 
notice this little band of people called Christians. And you know, as the story goes, the Jewish people had rejected Jesus as their Messiah. So this little band of people called, called Christians started recognizing him as their savior because of his teachings. He taught love, helping your neighbor, you know, the Ten Commandments, etc. And so Rome attached onto this and called it the Roman Catholic religion. Uh, and interesting where the word religion comes from. The way the Roman army organized themselves was through legions. They called them legionnaires and, and the general at the top was a legionnaire, one man in front of about 25 men as a legion, as a legionnaire. And uh, these were uh, warriors, well-equipped warriors. But as it developed, as it come back, they called it religion, religion, you know? And that's how they organized. They would send one priest into a community and he would Christianize everybody, and through their confession, let to believe everybody had to go to confession. And if you made a sin, you were punished. So one man could control, and through confession, he knew what was going on in the communities. He kept track of people. And later came the women, the nuns, to help Christianize. So, so when they passed this terra nullis, the governments, uh, mostly uh, Portugal and Spain, put enough pressure on the Pope to uh, declare those papal bulls called Terra Nullis, vacant land. And indigenous people were considered part of the land. They weren't considered human beings. Our ancestors wouldn't, were not considered human. They were subhuman. So therefore, they could be, and Terra Nullis means that you can go into a land where it's non-Christian hasn't been Christianized yet. So when they come over here, they came over for two things, to colonize the land and to Christianize the people. When you drive here from wherever you come from, you see these fields, all clear cotton and stuff, that's colonized land. Where this hotel is sitting on, this hotel is colonization. And the underpinnings of colonization are to conquer, to dominate, and to control, and to extract. And you see that happening more and more in the boreal forest. There's so much oil and gas activity. It's just phenomenal how they're colonizing the land, the boreal forest and they're destroying it. This week, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, I attended a community environmental monitoring gathering at Narrow Lake. It's, it's southwest of Athabasca for three days. And 17 indigenous communities came and provincial and federal uh, government people that work in environment also attended. Each community has developed its own methodology, how to monitor the environmental impacts of development of forestry, of oil well wells, and of gas wells. And uh, it's phenomenal, the work they're doing. Um, the cut lines, 
the well sites, the logging operation. Um, is chasing the animals away. And after they do a well site, um, they spray it with a chemical and, and kills the berries, kills the plants, all the medicine plants and everything. Sterilizes the land. That's what they're doing to Mother Earth. They're very concerned about that. So in the Western worldview, they've got this this concept of climate change. And they blame, they're starting to blame everything on climate. Um, it's destroying things. And, and so when I asked the question to climatologists and environmentalists, what's the meaning of climate? When you say climate, what do you mean? What's its meaning to you? Is it animate or is it inanimate? Is it alive or is it dead or is it just an object? Like science has this fascination of objectifying everything. Becomes an object and then on their Cartesian split model, where the, where the base signs off of, you know, the, the y-axis is the vertical and the horizontal is the x. And if you can measure and plot stuffing on there, by God, you got reality by the tail, according to their thinking, okay? But if you were to put that right angle within a circle, it only forms the right-hand quadrant of the circle. And it only can measure, and science is based on measurement. Uh, uh, anything it can't measure, it represses, puts under the table. It can only measure the physicalness of things. So when you go and visit a doctor, what, does, what do they do? They take your temperature, blood pressure, your height, your weight, etc. right? But within the circle, if it just forms the right-hand quadrant and it's the physicalness they're measuring, what about three quarters of the circle? What are they missing? What the signs cannot measure? Well, it's irachak, musetawana, nigwa mama tenichagan. They can't measure your spirit, your spirituality. They can't measure your emotions. I can't look at Charlie and say, Charlie, by the way, you're only 10% love today. You know, how can I measure that? You know, you can't measure your feelings. You're Your consciousness, what makes us think we're human? What makes the Western people think they're at the center of the universe where they control everything and own everything and conquer everything? You know, well, climate, to be Our Mother Earth made climate, and it's got the four aspects that we have. It has a spirit, it has emotion, it has a mind, and it has a body. And Mother Earth made it as a cleanser. It comes here to cleanse, help Mother Earth clean up the land. In the same way, Yotinoma, the wind, it's a living being. Everything's alive. Everything that Mother Earth creates has the four aspects that we do. Creation is an everything. Creation is me and you and everything. And the other thing about Christianity is that it anthropomorphized um, uh, the uh, Orion Belt. Anthropomorphized means that they made it human-like. Has anybody seen the Orion Belt? It appears in the morning in the eastern sky. It's like a kite. It's like a V. It's, it's like a kite shape like this, like this and there's a tail. So what the Egyptians 
uh, thought was that and on the left-hand side of the Orion belt are three bright stars. They said those are the wise men, the three wise men. And on the right-hand side, there's a bright star, a little dimmer star and a little baby star. They said that was the father, the mother, and the son. In the tail, there's, a, there's stars lined up in a, in a line. That's the flock. That's the people following. So what the Christians did, they anthropomorphized. They made those into human-like figures. Uh, also, their God becomes a human-like figure. But my understanding is, in our indigenous worldview and spirituality, we didn't do that because we know spirit is in everything. A chakoma. So when, sometimes when I get the opportunity to go into a classroom, say um, grade uh, five to eight, I'll ask a question. Can anybody name me a star in our universe? Can anybody name me a star in our universe? And they look at one another, they won't look at me, so I'll give them a hint. I'll say, you know when you go outside, you know that yellow light you're seeing out there? There's a big object in the sky, so bright you can't look at it? That's a star. Our sun is a star. And in the Cree language, stars are achakwak. Achakosak. Stars are spirits. So then I'll ask them, has anybody seen spirit today? You know, and they'll look around, well, if you're seeing the sunlight, the sun, the sun's a star, and you're seeing its light, then you're seeing spirit. Spirit's in everything. Now, Western science is getting to the point where they think they can conquer climate and dominate climate and control climate by cutting back on carbon, carbon monoxide mostly, um, because they know that leads to uh, global warming. Do you think Western science can colonize the climate? I don't think so. Now they're starting to think about already uh, when this, like, this modernity, this age we're living in, this modern age, there's more and more people thinking that it just can't sustain it. It's unsustainable. You just can't keep thinking that Mother Earth's gifts, Umigewana, are infinite. They're not. They're very finite. I gave you an example of, of how small Mother Earth is compared to the sun, maybe, or compared to other, other planets. This is all we got. We're just like a little speck, like a little uh, sand grain in this huge infinity this, what we call the universe, it's infinite. You just can't find the edge of it or the limit of it. And there's new stars being born, there's new spirits coming through constantly. Every once in a while, they say there's probably about 60 meteorites that hit Mother Earth every minute. Well, meteorite is mostly made of water, nippy, oma nippy. And it all has rare earth minerals. The minerals that are in our brains are not from here. They come from the stars. So the, the teaching is also that we're star people. That's our reality. And 
And we don't have a word in, like, in my language for death. When somebody dies, we don't say that. We say, Aoyaki Nagata skate. We say, somebody's left earth. Have you heard somebody's left earth? Because we're star people. We go back and there's a ceremony. It's called the Star Lodge ceremony. Has anybody attended a Star Lodge ceremony here? Two of us. Uh, it's a special ceremony. And it's pretty rare, but it's starting to be revitalized. Um, that's when the star people come and visit us. The teachings says that uh, you need a wampum belt. Wampum belt. Has anybody seen a wampum belt? It's an it's a eastern. And when you look at the wampum belt through a prism, uh, it creates a hologram. And there's a message in the hologram. But you need that uh, in the Star Lodge as well. So when they start coming in, and you just can't go into a Star Lodge without going to a sweat lodge, for example, pipe ceremonies, etc. You have to be on the spiritual path. Um, and some of you probably are, will be interested in it. But ask Creator. Anything you ask with Sagitwin, he'll never refuse you. So let's talk about culture. I said uh, language, experience, culture. Well, what is culture? Uh, I became interested in it at a young age. So therefore, I, I did a master's. I did an undergrad in culture, and my minor was political science. I spent 17 years in politics. Uh, I sat around the constitutional table negotiating Métis as an indigenous, as an Aboriginal people in Section 35 of the Constitution. But what's, what is culture? When I was teaching at McGill in Montreal on the McDonald campus, there was another professor there studying wax on apples because the original apple had a lot of wax coating to protect itself. But as it got uh, hibernized GMO, except the, the wax started, started looting its wax co coating, so they had to spray it. The bathroom was on the, in the basement of the, the building in the McDonald, on the McDonald campus where I was at. So I went down there, and he, the professor happened to be down there. He was a biologist. And he said, Elmer, can I show you my, my lab, my laboratory? And he had a lot of doctor students and master students and undergrads as well, because you've got to take a, a lab when you, go to, when you go to university. And when I walked in, there was fridges all lined up in the room, side by side, where students. He opened his fridge, and he said, I have 200 cultures in here. You know, you, you put a few... Uh, uh, bacteria spores um, in a petri dish and you have it, some food in there, it looks like wax, and it'll start growing. That's the, that's the true word of culture. You're culturing that. And I said, uh, thanks for the tremendous teaching. Now how did culture, a biological term, become applied to people, to try to understand people. So I had to rethink the definition of culture, at least my definition, and it became uh, beliefs, our beliefs, that become our values, and then our values determine our behaviors, and how we behave determines our relationships and interrelationships, our wagohtuwin. So, for example, if, if you believe in love, well, you know what you're going to value? Sagihtuwin. You know what your behavior is going to be? Loving. And guess what you're going to attract is another loving person. 
But say if you believe in Kustatuan, if you believe in fear, uh, you start valuing fear, uh, guess what the type of person you're going to attract is another f fearful person. And that's where there's going to be a lot of fights, uh, relationships breaking up, etc. Remember I asked the question, two emotions, one is real and one, one is unreal? Well, fear is totally unreal. Anything has a beginning and an end is really not real. Uh, but love, a chak, no beginning, no middle, no end. It's eternal. We're eternal beings. Uh, we come here for this experience. Like I believe that everybody sitting in this room is meant to be here. Even if you wanted to stay away, you couldn't. You had to come here. That's, that's the way it works, uh, the law of attraction, et cetera. And it's, the, the teaching is that everything like onto itself is drawn. So if you're a, a loving, kind, gentle human being, that's the type of people you're going to attract to yourself, other loving, kind, gentle being. I would say that was the community where we come from, because every community has four aspects cultural, uh, social, economical, and political. And those four aspects have to be cut in balance for that community to be happy and healthy. If you neglect your spirituality and your cultural practices and just focus on economics and politics like, like the non-Indigenous people do, society is not going to last not going to be a happy place. So now, as we head down this road, this modernity is slowly dying. The decay is happening from the inside out. It's like how an apple decays. It's from the inside out. Because we just can't sustain it. You know the cost of living now? because, you know, they blame it on inflation. But really, they're so greedy. You know, making a billion dollars is not enough. It's got to be two billion, etc. You know, at the destruction of Mother Earth, they objectify Mother Earth like she's got no feelings. And this water, like we, we say in the P, but to translate that, where does the word come from, Nepi? Actually, it comes from a bigger word, Nepi Tohtan. Nepi Tohtan Ota. So what happens when our mother's water broke? How did you come here? To water. You know, and water is a colonizing word from medieval English. Water. I really don't know what that means. Tell you the truth, you say science will say it's H2O, two molecules of hydrogen to one of oxygen. What is it really? So that's my interpretation and presentation of what creates worldview. And I think that's why these, the young people, you know, from little children to to millennials, et cetera, are so thirsty for their indigenous language and their spirituality. They want to get back to living with the land rather than living off the land and helping Mother Earth clean. Our, one of our duties here is to steward, is to help Mother Earth because we just can't take it for granted. You know, it's always going to be like this, this modernity, electric lights, natural gas, uh, oil, etc. And some of our leaders 
are wise enough to start shifting away. They call it green energy. Well, we can adapt to that very easily because that's what we did. Our ancestors did as well. You know, they didn't leave much of a footprint here. Thank you so much for, for coming and listening uh, to what I had to say. Uh, I thought about giving it totally in in Sagao uh, in in Bushland Cree, but then I would at least lose so many people if I did that. So I had to decide to, uh, to translate and to speak in English. When the colonizers see indigenous people not being able to speak their language or practice their spirituality, you know what they say? You're colonized. We got you. You know, so when we talk about decolonization now, we start with Mother Earth. We have to decolonize the destructions they've done. And the young children there um, will start to revitalize. Because all our wisdom of our ancestors are embedded in our DNA and what we call blood memory. It's there. And some of you will be gifted speakers. Others will struggle a little bit. But I, what I would suggest is don't give up. This creator doesn't give you a challenge you cannot handle. When it's really, really tough, that's when you're going to make your most gains in this life. Uh, and we come here uh, to a great extent also to, to experience the suffering, you know, aches and pains, etc. Because when we leave, there's about seven different soul planes that I'm aware of. This is just one of them. And we're here just for a very short time, then we'll go to another soul plane where we have different experiences. Uh, but the seventh one is mostly light. Wasia when that's where the spiritual beings are. Okisagoak. We call them Okisagoak. So thank you.